Do we have too much government? We need to put uh, people in ahead of corporate profits. This system is so lopsided. This threat is a real threat to democracy. And I think that's really important. That's something we haven't been doing in this country for a long time. Where do you start? What do you do? How do you do it? Access to Democracy is sponsored by Thomson Reuters, providing legal professionals with the intelligence, technology, and human expertise they need to find trusted answers. Products include Westlaw, Practical Law, and Firm Central legal practice management software for small law firms. Thomson Reuters, the answer company. Online at ThomsonReuters.com. Access to Democracy is made possible in part by a donation from Firefly Credit Union. Firefly is the new name of U.S. Federal Credit Union, which has proudly served the financial needs of the Greater Twin Cities community since 1925. At Firefly, we guide our members forward and give them the power to chase dreams by delivering the financial solutions they need to get ahead. From checking accounts to mortgages, we'll light the way. We are Firefly Credit Union, and this is Life Illuminated. And Dr. Charles Crutchfield of award-winning Crutchfield Dermatology in Egan, acknowledged as one of the nation's best physicians. A Minnesota native who trained at the Mayo Clinic, Dr. Crutchfield personally treats all patients and states that experience counts and quality matters. Crutchfield Dermatology, look good, feel great, with beautiful skin. And scratching his ear, uh, we return with Access to Democracy, uh, one of our repeat and favorite guests, the police chief of Egan, Minnesota, Jim McDonald, uh, unique in many ways, and a nice guy to boot. Now, he's also my boss at the moment. You can't see it, but I'll hold it up here. Uh, I am presently attending the Egan Citizens Academy. And if you thought you knew anything about policing and police work, you knew nothing. Mm -hmm. And uh, this eight-week session, of which we're only uh, completed two weeks, has been just illuminating and fascinating. And uh, why don't you pick up on that? All right. Well, Alan, thank you. It's uh, great to be here. I was trying to think when we were talking off camera how long or how many times I've been on your show, and it's got to be 10 anyway, um, but I appreciate being back. And, uh, uh, but regarding Citizens Academy, uh, we've been doing it for 22 years. Um, it's really neat to see residents come in and uh, have excitement and interest about what the police do, and um, the Academy is eight weeks, uh, and you mentioned you're in your second one, and uh, mm -hmm. we expose people, residents, to different aspects of policing, evidence collection, patrol work, uh, I think last... So much I didn't know, for instance, that we do our own forensics now, mm -hmm. uh, that we have this evidence room that goes back probably to the year one with all sorts of material that's been impounded and picked up and uh, used in criminal cases and all, and you have an advanced academy also. Right. Uh, we do a number of academies, actually. Uh, we just did a media academy um, and really carved out a niche of uh, of one of the responsibilities, and that's when we use force. And uh, we did use of force demonstrations for some of the media members in the community as well, and uh, that turned out to be pretty popular. But it, the whole idea is just to do some outreach. Uh, we really need to get our brand out there and let people know what we do. Yeah, because policing... Uh, has not necessarily had the best of publicity nationwide in the last couple of years. <clears throat> but there's a uniqueness to your police force, not only in, in the quality of the officers, many of whom I have now met, uh, even some behind a radar gun on occasion, but uh, in years past, but my wife has made me slow down, so <clears throat> we haven't had that occasion recently. Uh, speaking of Sharon, uh, a graduate of both academies, mm -hmm. and as I said to Sheriff Tim Leslie, who was here today, this is our law enforcement St. Patty's Day. Yeah. Uh, uh, 
Sharon also took the Sheriff's Academy and five years of Tai Chi, so don't mess with her. It's, uh, and uh, believe me, I have found that out. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you do all of these things with these personable people, uh, these dedicated people, and they all have completed four years of college, a requirement I think that you put in. And uh, Yes. Um, and, and first of all, Ellen, your, your comments about the force is very humbling. Uh, we, we, and I think it's reflected, what you say, your words are reflected in a recent citizens survey that was completed. We, the police department did very well. Um, but like ninety-five percent positive, and uh, nobody really negative. Right, and 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 you know we're, we're able to accomplish that because of the community, uh, from the mayor and the council, mm -hmm. and my boss Dave Osberg. They support our the department's mission. Uh, certainly, the community does, and that's what makes us makes us effective. And and I'd be the first one to say, and I think I I speaking for a long line of police officers, that that. Uh, the cars we drive, personally, the homes we live in, personally, uh, are all because of the good people of Egan. And when, when we do hiring and when I screen for new recruits, I actually look for those sorts of values. People that want to serve, uh, they know, uh, I'm looking for people, they know that if they do a good job, they're not going to get a bonus at the end of the year. They, they do it because it's right here, uh, because it's the right thing to do. And um, I, I think those characteristics that, that we're finding in our candidates, which we search high and low for, I think that's paying dividends for uh, what we're doing in the community. Yeah, and I know that not only do you search high and low for them, but they really have to go through a rigorous series of tests and exams before you accept them, uh, including personal interviews and background interviews and everything else. Mm -hmm. And the result is that uh, I just think that you have people that are a cut above. Uh. Yeah, uh, you know, and if I could speak a little bit to uh, the hiring processes, and you mentioned it is, uh, you can't apply for the Egan Police Department unless you have a four-year college degree. Uh, many of our candidates, at least 19, many of our officers, at least 19 of the 70 have master's degrees, which is pretty good. And I, and I think I think that alone demonstrates the educational level of Egan, and I think you know that's important for the department to mirror that. Um, but speaking to the, the the process, when someone applies for the Egan Police Department, and we think that we have a good candidate, if that candidate lived in New York or Arizona or California, I'll actually put an investigator on a plane, and that investigator investigator will go to one of those locations and talk to teachers, talk to past employers, talk to landlords and family members and friends and whatnot to make sure that we're getting what is advertised. And I, and I firmly believe the best predictor of future behavior is to look at the past. And, and that's worked out pretty well for us. Yeah, you mentioned that in, in the training session a week ago, and uh, I was surprised to hear that, mm -hmm. but uh, that's how thorough uh, the process is. And not everybody makes it. I, you know, I, I heard that there was, along the way, some people that drop out yep. for their own reasons or for the reasons that it's just not yeah. dovetailing with what they expected. Nothing, nothing has come true more to me than the, than the simple slogan, you can't judge a book by its cover. Because you, you, really, you really do have to dive deep, especially if you're looking for police candidates. And, uh, and it and has paid off. Now, you mentioned right before we went on air that social media has affected policing. Uh, what did you mean by that? Well, I, there's so many people that are, that are communicating via social media. Um, and, and what we're finding is inc inc incidents that are happening in Egan uh, turn into real-time media issues uh, because of people's <clears throat> willingness to get on social media. Um, if you follow us, the police department, we have our own Twitter page, at Egan Police, if you look on Twitter, um, you'll see that, that when something's unfolding in the community, people are actually posting pictures of the incident or asking questions. And there, and there, is, uh, there is the expectation that we respond. Um, I, I think uh, when I look back to the instances that we've been managing, some of the serious ones that we've been managing, our ability to appropriately uh, deliver a message um, uh, has been accomplished using our Twitter page. And 
you know, some of the national uh, efforts and the national swing is for police departments to get more involved in social media. So the way I see it is we'll need to get more involved, not, in, not on just Twitter, but we might have to utilize Facebook more, Snapchat more, and other social media platforms to effectively deliver messages. And, you know, I guess I'm finally going to have to get onto Twitter. Yeah. Uh, I actually have yeah. a handle, but I just never yeah. use it. But yep. uh, I, I, the, Some of the response we, we have, I, I think 4,600 followers, and some of the responses that we're getting, uh, that when I'm talking to people in the community is, I, I can't believe you're answering these questions. People will see something happening, and, and uh, they'll post a question on Twitter like, what's going on? And we'll answer. We may not get back right away. Our, our, our post or our, our, uh, our site is not monitored 24-7. But if Alan Miller were to post a question, we would get back to him. And, and it wouldn't be within five minutes. It might be a day or two, but you're going to get an answer. And you can't ask more than that. Right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, uh, yeah. You also have a publication called The Blue Blotter, yeah. which comes out about once a month that talks about some interesting things and some events that have involved mm -hmm. your officers. And <clears throat> I think people, if they're interested in that, they can contact me or contact the Egan police and get on that mailing list. Mm -hmm. uh, Katie Jonas does a great job and uh, putting that together. Yeah, Alan, and and let, me, let me say, I have to give credit where it's due. Katie, Katie has a handle in that, but actually Jill Andre, the crime prevention specialist, does a lot of the development. Oh, really? And uh, she, she does an outstanding yeah, job. Yeah, and, and I, I think that pub <coughs> publication is pop popular, and I have to give credit where it's due. Is actually My predecessor, Ken Thurkelson, started that. I, was, I dovetailed. Um, and it is really just a snapshot of just one of the, you know, a handful of the monthly calls that we deal with. And, and just so your, your viewers know, we, we manage 51,000 calls a year for service. Um, and, and the blue blotter is just a... Which is almost one per person in Egan. I yes, think we indeed. have 66,000 Indeed, now, so that's a Indeed. But, but the blue blotter <laughs> is there's a little bit of humor at the expense of some criminals, but, but it is informative. People like it. Yeah. And uh, by all means, anybody interested, give the police a call or get in touch with us, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll be happy to. Now, one thing we've had probably more of in Egan over the last year or two, and I think it reflects society in general, is we've had some homicides. Uh, in fact, I think there was one officer involved shooting. Yes. And uh, some homicides arising out of domestic issues or whatever. And uh, Yeah, I, you know, the, the officer involved shooting, uh, uh, very unfortunate, it occurred l last August, August of 2016, at the end of the month on a Sunday. Um, really sorry, sad deal where there was a man uh, having a mental health crisis. And, and I, I would say mental health crisis has been on our radar for years. We've seen uh, exponential increase from year to year of mental health type cases. Um, and this was a situation where a man was out in the parking lot. He was firing a handgun indiscriminately into all directions. And uh, what we pieced together is that he wanted to force a confrontation with the police because it, it, what we believe is, is he wanted a, a suicide by cop. And, and that's and ultimately that what it turned out to be. That is something that's become more prevalent. Uh, and I can't believe you don't have the courage, I guess, to put the gun to your head, but you want to bring out the police department mm -hmm. to do mm -hmm. it for you. Uh, yep. It's really an unfortunate circumstance, and it cries out for people needing more help, mental health, uh, which is a big problem. Yeah, it does. And, and you know, I, I, <coughs> I, I can't get past the notion that this is someone's uh, dad or son or whoever. Um, and it's, it's really just an unfortunate circumstance that we're facing in society that the police have to deal with. Because I'm not kidding, Alan, we deal with these types of instances, not to this degree, but we deal with people having mental health crises every day. Like, I, I'm going to say four or five times a day. Well, I saw the st statistics, and uh, it was overwhelming mm -hmm. uh, of the calls on the mm -hmm. chart, mm -hmm. how many were for mental health. Mm -hmm. Yes. There's no, t there's no sign of it slowing down. I, I don't see it. I think the pressure of our society is one thing. And, yeah, um, if, if I may, 
you know, I, I started seeing this in 2009, uh, 2010, and I was, I was starting to track it. And, you know, we know in 2009, 2010, our society was feeling the effects of a, of a, of a recession. Businesses were cutting back, people were losing their jobs, people were coming back from the Middle East. Um, and when you lose your job, what else do you lose but health care? And uh, there was just a lot of stress in society. And my theory was, is that people weren't getting the help that they needed. And with all this added stress, and, and now arguably the recession is gone, S some people are back to work, but there's still that stress in society. A and lot of stress. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and people are having difficulty <laughs> coping. I, I can't diagnose it any further than that. No, um, and you know, uh, more uh, mental health professionals probably, or cheaper mental health mm -hmm. uh, really services would be very helpful. Yeah. Now we also had uh, what was a sad event that, that turned out reasonably well when we have our original town hall. I think it goes back to 1914, mm -hmm. even before we were yep. a, a city. And uh, <coughs> someone set it on fire, it had a bunch of artifacts and all in there, mm -hmm. and it was set on fire uh, what, two years ago now? 2013, September 2013. Longer than that. Mm -hmm. That crime has now been solved. Yes. So let's let's walk through that procedure. Well, uh, it was quite an ordeal. Um, <coughs> the two suspects that we identified, um, we had previously put in put each of them in prison. They were they were brothers, uh, Wynn and Wade Arvidson. Uh, Wade Arvidson, his his alias is Michael Damron. Um, uh, we had con we had imprisoned him for damaging uh, uh, or for possessing a whole bunch of stolen property uh, that he was holding at his Egan house. Uh, his brother Wynn, we had imprisoned because he had gotten into a fight at one of the local establishments and uh, uh, allegedly, or he did, stab someone. So we put both of them in prison and then they had uh, filed a lawsuit against the city, a $12 million lawsuit, and then the city had gotten summary judgment. And, uh, and so they were thrown out of court. It was thrown out of court. Well, and win, win should, been named, should have been named loser. Yeah. But, uh. <laughs> well, what happened is, is once they were released from prison, uh, it's our belief it was revenge, and they took their revenge out by, by attempting to burn down Old Town Hall in September of 2013. Um, we had put a case together. It was very involved. Quick response, save the town hall, but we did lose some artifacts. We did, and, th and th I have to uh, congratulate our friends at Egan Fire because they arrived quickly and, and extinguished the fire. I mean, it was like at 4 in the morning, and one of our officers had left uh, the back lot of the PD. It came out, and he saw the place was on fire, and he quickly called Egan Fire. They came out and extinguished it. Um, but that started a long investigation in which we identified the two brothers that I mentioned. Uh, and, and Alan, this is our version of CSI. Everybody watches CSI on television. I, I refer to this as Egan CSI. We collected DNA evidence. We collected uh, uh, computers where we, we were able to view security video. We collected cell phones. And, and we have the personnel within the city of Egan, within the e walls of the Egan Police Department that could effectively capture evidence off of those types of devices. And that was the linchpin. Not everybody in a small department uh, is able to do forensics to the degree that you're now doing it in Egan. Yeah. And I would say that, that goes back to the, to the investment that the community and the council and my boss um, and the goals that I have uh, of, of making sure that we have that capability. Um, if, if we weren't able to do that, we would, have, we would have needed to rely upon other organizations to get that done. The BCA. And the BCA or, or some other organization. And, and, I, and, and what you lose there is um, you lose the expertise. Um, the, I, I can tell you from the in-house expertise, and I can tell you when you're at a scene and you're going to collect computers or phones or whatever, these personnel that we have trained are quick references. They can tell us how to collect the data. They can tell us how to write the search warrants. And, you know, that, is, that, was, that proves to be so crucial in this investigation. Now, one of these two felons uh, also left a DNA sample for your people. Yeah, uh, yeah they, uh, they 
uh, pooped at the scene, and uh, we collected a sample of the of the feces and submitted that as DNA evidence because you could get DNA out of out of feces, and uh, it was a positive match for wind, Arvidsson. As I said, he should have, he should have been named loser. Well, you know, I say, I'll say this is you know, kind of humorous. Is I mean, you stumble upon a scene and you f see a pile of feces there. It's like, okay, who's going to collect this? And you quickly look around and you say, okay, this is when you find out what rank and seniority mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it came home to roost, however. It did. It did, yes. yes and uh, so, yeah, we were able to get convictions on both of those parties. And, and I want to say this. I'm going to give a shameful, uh, uh, shameful plug is that this case that I just briefly talked about, Alan, uh, I think the, the public would be very interested in hearing the ins and outs of how we crack this and, uh, and the, the background of these two characters that are now in prison. I, I am, I'm scheduling a, a forum a pr to do a presentation on this whole case. And, and really? Yep, and, and I'm uh, preliminary, you can mark your calendar, Wednesday, May 10th at Egan High School. I already got the venue booked. It would be nice if we could get Egan TV there. Well. If it's possible. Yeah, yeah but you're, I, we're gonna, it's just gonna be a community invite. And uh, I, I think people will be captivated. I'm thinking about three hours, because this is, this is really an interesting case. Egan Police Department would like to give you the poop. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay. All right. I don't know <laughs> if we'll put that on any banner or anything, but okay, we'll roll with it. Now, uh, we talked, uh, among other things, about the proliferation of cheap drugs and how that has mm -hmm. kicked up people mm -hmm. who get hooked uh, by these very shrewd characters mm -hmm. who make meth and heroin cheap mm -hmm. and then people get desperate mm -hmm. and they end up in the bad. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, not only the I, I will say this, uh, we, we've been facing an epidemic with heroin. Uh, meth has always been there, but, but heroin had recently come on the scene. I mean, that's an old drug, but it's, it saw a resurgence. Um, to combat heroin um, and the overdoses, we outfitted uh, our officers with Narcan, which would offset, if someone's having an overdose and an officer arrives and they're unconscious, if an overdose of heroin is suspected, they take this little vial of Narcan, it's a mist, and you, you insert it into the person's nostrils, you, you, you shoot it in, and the person snaps out of it. And I can and tell- And doesn't die. We yeah. just, within the last two weeks, we just mm -hmm. saved someone from an overdose with, with that very scenario. Someone was passed out, suspected heroin overdose, uh, uh, administered the Narcan, and the person came, they woke right up, it was, it's, it's like immediate. And, um, and so we're able to save some lives, um, and we're really working with our drug task force to identify the, the people that are distributing this drug because it, it is dangerous. And, and, and people that are hooked on heroin, it's just so unfortunate. It's, it's, it's you know, a really an epi a epidemic and a scourge on our society. And uh, unfortunately, it just makes your job tougher. Yeah, <coughs> indeed. And busier. Yeah. You know, and th there's a lot of things that go along with that is, is uh, you know, the violence and, and uh, you know, officers potentially getting stuck with needles when they're dealing with folks like this. It's just, it's just really icky when someone starts to go yeah. down that path. Now, there are a lot of traffic cams around mm -hmm. uh, that really record so much of what goes on in our society today. Mm -hmm. And I know one of the questions you were asked was, uh, why don't the police wear body cams? Now, of course, they have in every patrol car a camera, yes, which records. Yep. <clears throat> so you made a decision that uh, they're more trouble than they're worth. Well, um, I don't know if I'd characterize it that way. Um, the body cam, not, aside from traffic cams, which you can't have in Minnesota uh, uh, on on uh, intersections, we have we have cameras in our squad cars, dash cams. Um, those have been popular with us. They, they help us with DWIs and some of those violations in, involving driving. Um, the new body cams that, that you're seeing spring up, the, the, those initiatives, um, I think we're a little 
I, I for one, want to step back and watch how this all develops. I have not had a lot of people from the community come forward and say, you really need to institute a body cam program. Um, I, I'm taking the wait and see approach. Um, those initiatives are very expensive. Uh, we, we've investigated some of the uh, um, preliminary costs. We're talking about 250000 to get started and, and potentially $100,000 a year just to store data. Um, I'm not sure there's a lot of value for well, us right now. Especially with the police uh, car cam. Yeah, indeed. So. And, and, and you can't take the car cam to an apartment door inside a house. But what you can do, Alan, and, and, and our officers have these, is they have digital camera or digital uh, audio recorders in their, in their pocket. So at least you can capture, and we've been doing that for a long time, you can capture conversation. And, um, you know, if you, were, if you were to sit and listen to some of the, the, the debate about body cams, some of the scholars are going to tell you the body cam is going to catch everything. The cameras aren't fast enough. It, you got to go frame by frame. And it, there, there's, just, there's a few issues that I'm not comfortable with. In addition to that, I was dumbfounded when, uh, I, I often am, but uh, in particular when I saw the amount of equipment each officer has to carry with him, mm -hmm. with, uh, you know, uh, with the chest protector, uh, mm -hmm. it, it amounts to 25 pounds worth of material. Mm -hmm. Do they need that? They have batons, mm -hmm. they have tasers, yeah. uh, they have uh, I, handcuffs, mm -hmm. they have safety right. equipment, yep. uh, mm -hmm. it, it, their pistol. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it just, yep. it really knocked me out mm -hmm. to uh, understand. You, know, you gotta lug that around with you yeah. or, all the time? Well, I think the, I th I think the cameras are getting to a size that, that wouldn't add that much more weight. Um, and, and, and don't get me wrong, I think, I think some people, some organizations feel that they really need them and it, it will help build trust. Um, I, I, I'd like to say, um, before we implement a, a body cam program, is that we really need to reach out to our community and really kind of take the temperature of the community and, and, and really ask them, do, do you really feel that we need a body cam program? Um, it, it's, it's just, you, I, think, I think you get that, uh, you get a good sense from the value of what you spend. And I'd like to say that we've used up almost our half an hour, <laughs> and I have a whole list here, so uh, maybe we'll bring you back or maybe somebody else from the department mm -hmm. in a few months and pick up where we, we mm -hmm. left off here. Because So we've been talking with uh, Chief Jim McDonald of the Egan Police Department, who's a regular guest yep. and a really informed and very interesting speaker. Mm -hmm. and. Hope to have you back soon. All right. But I thank you and I'll see you at the Academy. Thank you, Alan. I'll come back anytime. Okay.